This is about stopping the right people, the right place, the right location. Okay. Again, take Mount Haven where we had the most problems. Right. And most problems we had there was robberies and grand larceny. And who the are those people robbing? The, rob the problem was what? Male blacks, and I told you they're all cool, and I have no problem telling you this. Male blacks, 14 to 20, 21. Welcome back. That is the recording that's grabbing all the headlines as it relates to the stop and frisk trial. Police Inspector Christopher McCormick ordering his subordinate to target young African-American men for street stops. At the heart of the stop and frisk trial is whether or not stops are conducted in a racially motivated way. But can stop and frisk be implemented in less, less discriminatory manner? For more, we're joined by Curtis Lee, our radio talk show host and the founder of the Guardian Angels. Welcome, Curtis. How are you tonight? Oh, pleasure to be with you, Dominic, because I know we're going to get in on over stop and frisk. Yeah. Okay, well, well, let's do exactly that. Let's get to it. Opponents of stop and frisk say the practice is just institutionalized racial profiling. Do you agree? Oh, there's no doubt it's profiling. In fact, I profile every day just to stay alive. But, Dominic, there's nobody who has been stopped and frisked more than yours truly, Curtis Lee, at least from 1979 to 1992, by these cops, many of whom are retired now on half pay with a full boat down in Boca Raton with an ice cream stand for a second income. So I know all about how it can be misused and abused. And there's no doubt there's plenty of that going on, particularly when a sergeant, while giving the orders before shift change, says, hey... You got five stop and frisk you have to do today. That's your quota. That's absolutely wrong. But how do you argue against the stats? They just came out. Do you realize as good as 2012 was in terms of the lowering of violent crime, the 2013 is even better. We are going to have the lowest murder rate since Dwight D. Eisenhower was president and Mickey Mantle won the Triple Crown for the Yankees in 1956. Boy. That's, that's a lot that's at stake here because of stop and frisk. Well, you founded the Guardian Angels as a response to rampant crime. Since then, you've covered the ebb and flow of violence in New York City. Will the streets of New York become more dangerous without stop and frisk? Uh, more dangerous, yes, but it doesn't have to go back to the time when I started the group 34 years ago, 1979, when there was almost no stop and frisk. Let's look at it as it started. Rudy Giuliani gets elected. He barely beats David Dinkins the second time. He brings in Bill Bratton. They start stop and frisk. And there were about 100,000 plus people a year that were stopped during the Giuliani years, a little more as time went on. Then naturally, Bloomberg comes on the scene and he delegates all public safety aspects to Raymond Kelly. And now stop and frisk blows up because there were less cops. 42,000 when Giuliani started. 34,000 now that Kelly has inherited that with all the cuts. So naturally, to make up for the differential of not having enough cops, what do they do? They go out there and they figure it's a matter of numbers. The more guys you stop and frisk, the more guns you take off the street, the more crimes you prevent because guys realize we're being aggressive. Now, is that right morally and constitutionally? Probably not. But what do you do to fill the void? I don't want to go back to the way it was in 1979, Dominic. Curtis, is stop and frisk an all or nothing proposition? Can it be applied in a less discriminatory manner while maintaining effectiveness? Oh, there's no doubt, Dominic, it has to be less discriminatory because the numbers are overwhelming. I mean, if I were a person of color, let's say I was Sicilian, right? I had a little color in my complexion. Hey, I might be the one who's getting stopped and frisk if I were wearing an Armani suit in the wrong neighborhood at the wrong time at the wrong place, even though I look like a professional man or a professional woman. You're absolutely right about that. So I think we have to be careful, though, that Judge Shira Shinlin, remember, she's making the decision in all three stop and frisk cases, and I know her well because she presided in the John Gotti Jr. trial and cut him loose for trying to kill me. So she always bends to the defense. There has to be a moderation here, a modification, but you can't throw stop and frisk out like you would the baby with the bathwater. Well, Mayor Michael Bloomberg, as you know, Curtis, and Police Commissioner Ray Kelly have spoken out against creating an NYPD inspector general position. What do you think? Oh, who whipped up that one from Jumani Williams, the city councilman who was working overtime 
to make sure that somebody was looking over the shoulder of whether it's Ray Kelly or any future police commissioner. It was Christine Quinn with a glow-in-the-dark orange Revlon hair, the speaker of the 51 slackers of New York City Council who wants to be our next mayor over my dead body, who decided, oh, I want Kelly as my next police commissioner, but I want him to have a watchdog peering over his shoulder. And I'm saying to myself, don't we have enough layers of bureaucracy? Aren't there enough checks and balances? Does the city council have such little time on its hands to be able to deal with serious issues? And you know this, Dominic, 80% of the high school graduates of New York City's public schools end up having to take remedial courses in their first year of college. Uh, I think that's a little bit more of a serious problem that needs oversight than Raymond Kelly or any future police commissioner of the NYPD. So I only have a few seconds here left, Curtis. So in other words, you believe Christine Quinn's position for an inspector general for the NYPD is politically motivated? Oh, Dominic, I don't know what her position is. It depends on the temperature of the day and, I guess, the claro she used to rinse out her hair. This woman flips, flops, flips, flops on almost every issue. Look, even the sick pay, the five, five days of sick pay that would be extracted from small uh, local businessmen, well, all of a sudden she was flipping and flopping on that. This woman flips and flops more than flip of the dolphin out of water. Brother Curtis Lee will tell us what you really think. We thank you so much for joining us tonight. Oh, anytime, my brother in solidarity, anytime. Okay, for more, let's now bring in tonight's panel. We are joined by Jessica Proud, Republican strategist and vice president at NLO Strategies, and Eric Cook, a media consultant with Hiltzik Strategies, and former press secretary for Congressman Anthony Weiner, so nice to see you folks tonight on this Friday night. I guess let's start with you, Jessica, <laughs> to counter Mr. Sliwa. I have to go after Mr. Sliwa? Yes. Come on now. Curtis says it far more colorfully and interesting <laughs> than I ever could. But I agree with him on a lot of those points. I mean, the fact is stop and frisk has been a very effective tool in helping to get guns off the street, illegal guns. And with all this talk of gun violence and cracking down on it, this has actually been an effective tool. Now, I don't think that th there can't be some modifications to make it better, and there are some issues. I will say, I think you played just a small clip of that recording, and when you look at the whole thing and its Good context, point. Good point. it definitely, it, it, it paints a much larger picture. And you can't take one instance and indict the whole program and the whole police department based on one instance anyway. So I think if you want to envision a city without stop and frisk, you can look to Philadelphia, you can look to Chicago, where gun violence and murders are through the roof. And I don't think that's the place that we want to go back to in New York. Well, to quote famous American Donald Rumsfeld, I think stop and frisk is a tactic and not a strategy. Uh, over the course of 2002 to 2011, 3.8 million black and Latino men in New York City were stopped and frisked. The vast majority of them were innocent. Uh, 3.8 million is actually more black and Latino men than are in all of New York City. So we're, we are continuing to, uh, to, to, to go into these neighborhoods and we are stigmatizing, we are uh, building a corrosive relationship between the police officers and the community. I think that stop and frisk is, it's a valuable tool, but it's not the be all and end all. It shouldn't be the first strategy. I mean, you look at cities like Los Angeles, uh, uh, Los Angeles, Dallas, New Orleans, Baltimore. These are all cities that don't have stop and frisk that have all seen massive reductions in crime over the same time period. So there's no actual concrete study that says stop and frisk is the reason why crime has, violent crime has gone down in New York City. Well, you can't dispute the fact that it's gotten thousands of illegal guns off the street, and let's get real about it. The majority of these crimes are being committed by young black males against other young black males. So this is saving lives, and that's something that, you know, it's a harsh reality that I think we all need to look at, and that's not saying that it, it should be racial profiling or discriminatory, mm -hmm. and I can't pretend to know what that feels like to go through that when you're doing nothing wrong. Wrong. B and I agree, it is a tactic, but it's one that should be maybe reformed and fixed, not gotten rid of okay, altogether. Well, well, Eric, does Jessica have a point to the degree that the police department says, look, we go where the crime is, and the crime is being committed in communities of color, young black men on young black men, black on black crime? 
I mean, I think that th I, I saw a statistic today that showed that in, I believe it was Borough Park, where the uh, population of African American Latino men is very small, still 75% of stop and frisks happen to young black and Latino men. So it's clear that there is some sort of racial profiling happening, and that's why I believe that an IG would be something that's good. Look, the, the CIA has. A, uh, an inspector general, the NSA has an inspector general, the FBI has an inspector general. If the, the agencies that we entrust to defend us from terrorism, from foreign agents, all can have inspector generals, I think the NYPD can have an inspector Jessica, general. Jessica, let me, let me uh, try and flip this now. Mm -hmm. uh, one commander in Brooklyn, you know the uh, high profile uh, quotes that have come out of this trial so far, mm -hmm. uh, saying that you know, make arrests in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn. And he went on to say, this is Bed-Stuy. I'm sure everyone has an open warrant. Is that the type of police department, the mentality of officers that we want protecting our streets? No, it's not. But that was my whole point of, like, how you cannot take one person's comments and indict an entire program or an entire police department. And the fact of the matter is this city is the largest the safest, largest big city. And I think that you cannot go, you cannot look at it just through one person's comments and say, well, the whole system is corrupt. Maybe one person wasn't running his department the way he should, but then make changes. Don't, like Curtis said, throw the baby out with the bathwater. Okay. Which is exactly why an inspector general is someone who could come in, could look at this from, from 10,000 feet, and make necessary changes. The NY NYPD, it wouldn't, an IG wouldn't have any operational oversight. They wouldn't be going into precincts and saying, you do this, you do that. They would be purely for a, an oversight of the entire bureau. There wouldn't be overlapping with any of the other internal investigations. It's the exact reason why it needs to happen. Okay, at the end of the day, this is before Judge Scheinlin, before we take this break. Uh, ultimately, what do you think that she does? Or how do you think this case is going to end? It's a good question. I think certainly the, that testimony is going to play a key role in the case. I, you know, heard differing opinions on it. I hope that they see the larger picture here and come up with a situation that the the program itself is constitutional. That's already been ruled. So I, you know, I can't. I don't know. It, it remains to be seen. I don't know what's going to happen. Think, I, I think it is like you said. It is. It is constitutional. It is a tool that police officers and police organizations use across the country. But I do think that there is going to be need for significant reform, significant oversight, and I, I hope that that's where the court goes with it. it. Do you find, Eric, it's a coincidence that the police commissioner, Ray Kelly, announced this week uh, an African-American chief of staff, and also on the form where they document these stops, the uh, UF-250, officers are now, they not, no longer will be able to just check off the stop they have to give an explanation, a written explanation of why they're stopping people. Do you think that's a coincidence? That was dated, I think, March 5th, I'm, 13 days before I, the trial I, started. I, I, I tend to not believe in coincidences. I think that, that, that Commissioner Kelly is trying to do, uh, trying to make it more transparent, to try and make it uh, easier for folks to understand, and is trying to document just where uh, these things are happening and why they're happening. So I, I think that it's a step in the right direction, but I think an inspector general will help push it over the top. Inspector general? Well, look, if it's happening in the department right now, what do you need that for? I mean, they laid out very clearly what the policies are going to be. They're trying to fix the system. And why would you need some other bureaucratic entity to come in and oversee what's already being done? It's typical government. Okay, on that note, it is time for a break. But when we return on this Friday night, we will focus on the race for mayor in New York City. Was Christine Quinn's flip-flop on paid sick leave all about this contest? And how much do political associations really matter? Our mayoral strategy section is session, that is, is coming up next. Stay with us.